Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is author Greg Way. He is the author of Fallschirmjäger, which is a uh, an account of German paratroopers during the Second World War. Uh, excellent oral history. So, welcome, Greg. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me on board. <laughs> what I'd like to do, Greg, is just kind of jump right in. Uh, prior to starting recording, you, we were discussing that you're sort of an independent researcher and you like to kind of get down into the details of things. So how did you meet the gentlemen who are highlighted in your book? Well, it's, it's a long story and it, it started in, in America, to be honest. I, I got onto the internet in about 1998 when there wasn't really much on, on the internet at that time. It was in, it's still in its embryonic stage. And I'd had this interest, that there were certain triggers throughout my life from my childhood, from play, from watching uh, films, to reading comics, so World War, and of course, neighbours and family and close friends, family friends, that all had something to do with the Second World War. So I'd always had an interest in the Second World War from an early age. So there were, there were little triggers throughout my life that um, got me sort of more and more interested in, in the German side, because... I have only ever heard about the war from a British perspective or an American perspective. I just wanted to, even as a small child, I just wanted to know what their sort of perspective on, on the Second World War, because in Germany, of course, everything is, was taboo after the war, talking about the war or, or mentioning that you're involved in it. So if we fast forward to getting onto the internet, I thought it was going to be the be all end all because you couldn't really order books from anywhere. There was no Amazon back then. There were certain, you know, small bookshops online. You could buy a handful of books. There didn't seem to be anything about uh, German airborne forces. And I think I found two in five years, which became my, you know, the, 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 the fundamental for, for me to get the first information that I, I did. Uh, on German paratroopers and, and also a modeling magazine, which I mentioned in my book. Um, my book's there, by the way. Uh, get a quick visual plug. The, the, I, I came across a modeling magazine, not modeling as in uh, female models, male models, but in plastic modeling, tank modeling, something like that. And I found it in a bookshop, and inside was a, a pullout section that uh, highlighted three campaigns i think it was three campaigns that german paratroopers had, had taken part in and that sort of intrigued me more to find the books to then carry out more research and at that time i was in touch with a guy a young lad in america who asked me if i wanted to correspond with knight's cross recipients but his angle was that he just got signed photographs from them. So he wrote to all of the, the Knights Cross recipients that he could, it didn't matter whether they were Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine. And um, he put me in touch with some U-boat commanders, former U-boat commanders, because I was a submariner myself at the time. I, I was in submarines for 22 years. So I thought that'd be quite interesting. So I started corresponding with a few ex U-boat captains, because we had a lot in common. And then one day he, uh, he said, do you want to correspond with a a paratrooper, Knight's Cross winner, which I believe, if I remember rightly, was Alfred Gens, who was the first, apparently the first German paratrooper to step foot on Crete in, on May the 20th, 1941. So I said, yeah, and he sent me his address and I corresponded with him uh, for a little bit, just before he died, actually, in, in uh, I think it was 2000 or 2001. But he put me in touch with the Bund Deutsche Fallschirmjäger, the Federation of German Paratroopers, and it sort of it moved along there, and, and I suddenly found myself writing to more um, veterans, and suddenly, after an advert was placed in, not by me, by, by somebody else in Germany, in their magazine, the BDF's magazine, which is the Deutsche Fallschirmjäger, the DDF magazine, and suddenly I was getting mail from all over, from uh, Canada, from uh, Germany, uh, America, because quite a few para veterans lived in America and Canada and Germany and uh, other places, Spain. So I started to write back and, and correspond with quite a few veterans. And before I knew it, I'd accumulated a lot of material. And at, at that time, I, my, I couldn't translate hardly any of it, only military terms. And, and I'm still a bit like that now. <laughs> military terms where there's a lot of keywords, I can pick out text. 
So I, I, I sort of garnered a lot of friends in Germany because they knew what I was doing. And they, in, in return for translating some of these huge texts, they of course got to read it first. So that was their sort of angle for volunteering to do it. I mean, now, if you, if you try and get documents um, translated now by people on, on, that you meet on the internet, they, they just want to charge you money. But back then, guys were queuing up and willing to, to do it. So I, I accumulated this material. I then, st as, as the material was coming through, the, the, what they were actually writing was coming out. That this is, this is bloody interesting stuff, you know? It was given a different perspective of different campaigns and battle and their involvement in it. And, uh, you know, they were quite open. A lot of them were quite open about, about talking, of, you know, about their experiences. Where, where, where I was growing up, my own grandfather was reluctant to talk about the war and and other family members but here i had former enemy who were quite willing because of the taboos after the war where they hadn't been able to tell their story so i put together a website and started to build upon what they had uh, sent to me some of the information into sort of snippets you know of veteran accounts and things and the, and the website was really successful. I, mean, I think it was up there for five years before it came down and there was over a million hits. And that was big for 2000, you know, for 9, sure. 2000. and there was a forum on there that I'd expanded it. And then I thought about the book project and I thought, you know, would it, would it be accepted as a book? You know, would it have any interest? Would people have any interest either to the historian or the casual reader? So I put together a booklet, about 25 pages, and I sold about 100 copies. I had them made locally, printed, the black and white photographs, terrible uh, quality photographs. Um, I made them cheap as chips. And I sold 100 copies, 10 copies I sent out to, to people who had helped me out with research, like Mark Bando, because I'd become friends with Mark. And, and Mark had sent me a couple of copies of his book, about 101st Airborne and Armoured Units in uh, Normandy. And uh, I started to get a lot of good feedback. 100, like 100% 100 feedback. So I thought, well, maybe I'm onto something. Maybe people do want to read it. And the veterans themselves were also up for it. They wanted their stories to be told. You know, all of them in the book wanted their stories to be told because they hadn't had the opportunity to do it. Some of them had printed up some, uh, some really detailed documents after the war detailing their experiences, but they had nowhere to, to go with it. I know that, you know, now you look back that now that we've got more online bookshops, you can find memoirs by different veterans, Panzer veterans, Luftwaffe pilot veterans and everything that they've managed to publish after the war, you know, in the 50s, 60s. Sure. But there, there wasn't really anything by multiple veterans in a book, you know? So once I got their approval and I got the approval of this sort of uh, test booklet that I did, I then approached several UK and US based publishers and they all rejected it. They, they weren't interested. No, nobody was interested apart from one in the UK, which does a series of books, which you'll probably, you, you'll probably uh, recognize them. I won't mention them, but they wanted <laughs> to change the format that I wanted to keep the format. So I just wanted a format where I would give you all the information at the beginning, you know, an introduction, um, what the book's about, give you a, a detailed uh, TNA section, terms of abbreviation section, introduce the first veteran and let him talk. He finishes, introduce the next one, he talks. And that's how I wanted it. But they wanted to change the format to a history book where they wanted me to write about the different campaigns and battles and just use extracts from the veterans' accounts, therefore thereby destroying the accounts because you're missing out vital bits and just using text that is um, pertinent to that particular part of the historical account of the battle. So I refused and I said, no, I, 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 I won't do that. I want to keep the, the format that I would planned and I told the veterans about, i.e. to let them talk in words for the reader to, to just read their experiences. I'm glad you stuck by your guns because that is a, the most powerful aspect of the book, in my opinion, is that it is easily 85, 90% the veteran stories in their own words. So, yeah, exactly. You, well, that, that, was the original, that was the original title. Um, 
uh, yeah, Falschmiega, uh, World War II, in, in their own words or something like that, it was going to be called. But the, the, the publisher changed the title or suggested a new title. We came to a sort of arrangement in the end. But I wasn't worried about that as long as they kept the form, which they did. They were happy with the format. They, they were pleased that it, was, that it had stayed like that. You know, just the, the veteran talking. And in fact, it was, it was Mark Bando. You know, you know Mark from... Uh, I, I, I sure do. I've never had the chance to talk to him, but we're, like, we're Facebook acquaintances. And I love yeah. his stuff. He's an excellent author. He is, yeah, and, and he gave me a lot of advice at the beginning, and I've still got an email that he sent to me. I printed it off, and, and when I was unboxing everything, because in, in 2006, I stopped all my research. It just got boxed up because at the time, I just got promoted. I was in the Navy. I got promoted, and I had a bigger workload, and I was going away for longer. It just seemed we were going away longer and longer, months, months more at a time, and I had a young family, and something I had to give. So it was my research. I, I just could, did, could not get the time to follow it up anymore. So I boxed it up and I almost overnight, having been away for like six months, come back, forgot about it all. And I, I didn't touch it again, sadly, because in the meantime, of course, a lot of the veterans I, I started up relations with had, had passed away, which was quite sad. Um, but I followed through with what I'd promised back then to publish the accounts and thought, right, well, if I know they've passed away, I can't do nothing about that now, but I can, you know, maintain the promise I made and see it through now. So I, I, I did, I unboxed everything and, uh, and that was it. This time when I approached with a sample chapter, loved it, the, the publishers loved it. And the, the, the publishing editor was an ex, um, reenactor, Falsham Jaeger reenactor. So from his point of view, he loved it. He knew that everybody he knew would love it. And it would appeal not just to the amateur professional historian, but also the casual reader, because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, the, the people's stories are the true stories. You know, people like to read about that. So I, I was lucky that, well, I don't know if I was lucky because another big publisher also wanted it, but they were too late coming back. Um, but nobody wanted to change the format this time. They just wanted it as it was. So I was really pleased with, uh, with the result. So it was 20 years from start to finish. It was 20 years from the concept of, oh, I wonder if anyone would be interested in a book with, you know, with these guys accounts in to holding the hardback. But unfortunately, of course, unfortunately it was published on the 16th of March and we went into lockdown seven days later. So it's, it's, I, 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 because I haven't published a, had a book published before, I don't know what I've missed out on in terms of pub, publicizing, you know, certainly book fairs and things like that. So I've had to work twice as hard in self publicizing via Facebook page and Twitter and, and, and other mediums and my website um, to try and sort of catch up with what I might have lost out on. Uh, that makes that makes a lot of sense. One thing I found in reading the book was the fact that almost universally these gentlemen had they were very dispassionate about their experiences for, from from my perspective as a reader uh, read a lot of military history most of my listeners have read a lot of military history and you get uh, you, usually there, there's a sense of how deeply people were affected in combat especially you know close infantry combat and i'm not saying that your subjects weren't but they all i don't know if it was like the german personality or if it was the mentality of a paratrooper or if it was just enough time had passed but they they weren't blasé about their combat experiences but they were very matter of fact compared to a lot of other uh reminiscences i've read so did you find that during your interviews and the process of talking to these people and, and what would you chalk that up to well, it's funny you mention that because I was talking to, um, I, I used to have a really good friend, paratrooper veteran who, who lived up in the northeast, northwest of England. He sailed here after the war like quite a few did. And I used to go and visit him up in Morecambe. It's, it's a good seven or eight hours from, drive from here. And he would talk about Crete because he was on Crete. He was one of the early paratroopers back in 1941. And he was telling me a, a, a story which he hadn't told me before because he, he often used to repeat stories about Normandy and, and Italy. But this one, 
he was telling me and I could see that he was drifting off and the, the anecdote finished and he went off into a stare out of the window and I knew that he was he had, he had gone somewhere he, he had suddenly stepped back and his eyes sort of welled up so I, I, don't, I, I was a bit more immature then and I did really know do I say something now or do I leave him have his moment you know so he, he got quite emotional so to say dispassionate yes and no someone like um, Gerhard Schirmer who ended the war as a, an Oberstleutnant and spent the net, you know, he was handed over to the Russians by the British. I could say that he was quite dispassionate, but he was more bitter about the fact that he had surrendered to the British and then found himself spending 11 years in Russian captivity after. Not that he didn't hate the British, but he was very angry and he didn't really show much emotion about his, his experiences in the war more after you know the hell that he spent in russia for 11 oh, years certainly and, and um, if i could jump on that for a sec because that you just kind of really piqued my interest with that anecdote did uh did gerhardt really uh and i apologize if you're not remembering from the book did he go to great lengths to ensure he could surrender to a western army rather than the russians because i realized that that was vastly preferable to surrender to British oh, or yeah. American troops than Russian troops. Did, did he and his unit go out of their way or was that just kind of the luck of the draw when the war ended, they were closer to, to British formation? No, they were closer to Russians because I think they were, he's not, he's not mentioned in the book. Cause I, so I'm, I gotta say that I, even though I had corresponded with um, Knight's Cross recipient paratroopers like Alfred Gens, Gerhard Schirmer, Rudolf Witzig briefly, and I digress a minute because you, you're aware of who Rudolf Witzig was. He's, oh, certainly. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Even a mile, the whole deal. Uh, yeah. Well, I had been wanting to correspond to write to him, but I could not get his address anywhere. He's a bit elusive. And um, I finally came across his address and I thought, well, I, I, I've got nothing to lose. I'll, I'll drop a line. And I told him about the book project and I asked him if he would write a foreword for the book. And I waited and I waited and I got a reply back, which was quite negative. He was really negative about the book, that there was no historical value in publishing the accounts of 70 or 80 year old men who were 18, 19 when all these events happened. And um, I'm sorry, I would have to politely decline your offer to write the foreword. So I was absolutely gutted because I thought he would, he, you know, he, he would be interested, but zero historical value were his words. So two days later, following his letter, a letter came through from Fitzig's friend and author, James Lucas, who wrote Storming Eagles, which was, which I've still got here, which was the second book that I wrote, uh, that I read, that I bought. It was the only book I could find in bookshop. So James Lucas seconded his, his comments and said, yeah, he's absolutely right what he says. It's, there's no historical value in, you know, in 2001 to publish these men's stories. So two men, you know, I respected James Lucas for his writing and all the books that I've got of James Lucas and suddenly they both torn my world apart. But anyway, going back to Shermer uh, and the other RK uh, recipients that I've re corresponded with. Shermer was north of Berlin, was in a, one of the suburbs of Berlin. And of course, as the Russians closed in, they headed west like many, many men did. He'd already um, successfully, he'd been sent new recruits. It was like a, a, a replacement unit for parachute units that were operating in, in the Berlin area. And they'd sent him about 3,000 school children. Oh my goodness. So he immediately sent them west. He said, there's no point. What's the point? They're just all going to die. So he evacuated them west. Then a few days later, they had to evacuate themselves because the, the, the Russians had surrounded Berlin and were, were closing in. So yeah, the, it was the lesser of two evils, of course, because the Russians were after anyone that served in Russia, particularly officers. I mean, in some cases, like Regensburg prison camp, they, uh, which is mentioned in my book as well by Volker Stutzer, that German prisoners were being sold to the Russians at so oh many dollars a head. 
Um, so yeah, Sherman made it to Hamburg. He got as far as Hamburg with his staff and surrendered to a British medical unit. Um, and then that was it. A couple of days later, you're, you're not heading west to a cushy internment camp and he was gone. Like quite a few, like a few others that I'd corresponded with ended up in, in Russia, but were released within three or you know, four or five years or whatever. But Shermer spent 11 years in, uh, in Russia, almost 11 years. But there you go. That was, that's what the Russians deemed as punishment for their part in Russia. I got, in fact, I got, I got to tell you a quick story about Shermer. A, a friend of mine in Australia had come across uh, somebody who had a watch belonging to Gerhard Schirmer. And it was a watch given, him, given to him by his old boss, Walter Koch, many, uh, a couple of years later, a, a couple, uh, about a year before he died in 1943 in a car crash. So this watch meant a lot to him. He, he never took it off his arm during the rest of the war. And the watch was taken from him. And my friend in Australia knew the guy who had it. He had the watch inscribed on the back from his, his old boss, Koch. So I, he said to me, can you write to Shermer and ask him if he remembers this watch? So I did. And about a week, because it used to take a couple of weeks for letters to come back and forth. Sure. Because he said he was too old for the internet. And it, it was a rant. It was a massive rant. That watch is mine. Of course, I identify it. It was taken from me, May 1945. <laughs> I want it back. Get, I used to start legal, legal proceedings and tell me who's got it. So I had to write back again and say, you know, you, you've got to calm down. It's, it was classed as war booty. So <laughs> when it was taken from you, you've got no legal status to get it back, you know. But the rant went on for a long time because Shermer was instrumental in getting his Knight's Cross back. Knight's Cross was in museum is it modesto it's just yes. south of Ca yes. south san francisco correct it was in a museum there his knight's cross had been taken from him and ended up near san francisco but he had managed somehow with a lawyer to get it returned back to him so his son wolf now still has possession of his knight's cross but the watch he didn't get back <laughs> the guy the guy who owns it now well, he's not getting it back it was taken from him you know, he was a prisoner at the time. That's it. Finished. That's no, an amazing, I, amazing story. It's, it's amazing how kind of small the world is now compared to how oh, it yeah. had been you know, 75 years ago. That's fantastic. So it, I'm fascinated by, as you said, the kind of the subject of the war was taboo in Germany after 1945. But somehow these guys kind of managed to come together. They form an association. Like you said, they're part of the German Paratroopers Association. Was the, their image kind of rehabilitated over time? Like when did they start kind of publicly acknowledging that they had, you know, served in the Fallschirmjäger and that they had, uh, you know, fought in the war? It... Well, over the, 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 the years after, because the, the BDF, when it started, it, it, in the early 50s, was was like a, a yeah like a big get together of veterans but the reason they did it was because they'd established a search service because you know i suppose when you lose a war you you've you've got no access to to find your your lost men you know the men that are missing in action the men that have disappeared so they used the meeting as as the, the beginning of the search service so as many men as they could get to come together yeah, it was great to have a few beers, but the, the main purpose of it was to, for everyone to go through missing lists. Do you remember what happened to him? Yeah, he was killed. I don't know what happened to him. He, he disappeared in the river. And it was to try and build up a picture of what happened to the thousands of missing paratroopers at the, at the end of the war. I mean, now I mentioned in the book, I think it's 8,061 still listed as missing. Yes, sir. But, but in 1951 or two, when the first meeting took place, there were thousands thousands missing but of course they were some of them were still in captivity in russia that nobody knew about some had been you know some of us were died in england died in america as pow's and were buried in us and, and the uk or buried in france or belgium because some of them after leaving the uk after leaving the us ended up in belgian or french captivity so this this come together this meeting 
was primarily for search service and to raise funds as well for for those that have um, fallen upon hard times and also for aid packages to be sent to East Germany to um, families who, who are now living in the East who had lost and couldn't get the foodstuffs and things that uh, the guys that lived in West Germany. And also to look after the orphans of, of veterans. So they, they, they established this quite complex organization, but they, they put the hand of friendship out quite soon to like the New Zealand. So a lot of them became members of the New Zealand Association. Um, and globally, para, paratroop veterans, they, they, they just wanted peace and harmony. And, you know, so I, I can't really say if they'd all look back and regret what they'd done. I mean, they, they must have, particularly in old age, probably quite ashamed of, of, you know, what they did when they were 20, 19, like we all do. I mean, I, I'm ashamed <laughs> of some of the things I did when I was 19 and I'm only 50. So, yeah, it, it, and, and if you look at the organisation now, the work they do around the world with paratroopers from France or America, from Britain, you know, they, they all come together, beat, well, not this year, but normally they meet in places like Monte Cassino and, and Crete and other places, you know, all together. And they, they will go to the other country cemetery and pay their respects. So, yeah, it's a good thing. And of course, if it wasn't for the BDF, I wouldn't have been able to publish the book because it was they who were, were instrumental in, um, in getting the word around that I was interested. Which, of course, for some veterans sparked a bit of, you know, um, well, what's an Englishman interested in what we've got to say? So quite a few guys didn't write or they wrote very briefly and said, I'm not interested in your project, which is understandable. But luckily, there were, there were a few, quite a few that, that were interested wanted to tell the story oh and it's turned into a fantastic product that's for sure it's a wonderful book i am fascinated by the fact that you know Witzig and mr lucas didn't see any value in going forward with this especially in the late 90s early 2000s you've got the success of you know kind of the gold standard everybody goes back to stephen ambrose and pegasus bridge or band of brothers and followed up with the hbo miniseries so just the fact that there was obvious this level of interest for a historian like mr lucas to come back and say there was no value i find that fascinating uh, obviously there is a level of interest here even 20 years later because you've got a, a book published and, and a lot of interested folks hearing what's going on uh, at what point did you realize that you had something in hand that was going to be of interest to general readers did you kind of were, at what point were you able to kind of realize well in this instance this is going to be successful there is a level of fascination with what these men have to say well, I suppose that the test was the booklet that I, that I produced in 2001. That was, uh, that was a sort of test product. But I'd only went out to 100 people, and, and those 100 guys were already enthusiasts and, and historic, amateur historians and researchers and collectors and, and reenactors, you know, so they all had something, some interest in German airborne forces in World War II. So I took that into account and thought, well, they're not casual readers, they're, they're already interested in the subject because the subject is sort of niche 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 <laughs> not, not everybody likes reading military history second world war um german military history luftwaffe german airborne forces you know so you write down the back of this queue which when it comes to casual readers they go whoa well no we'll go on to you know something by you know, well-known authors like James Holland, who's, who's producing books about different aspects of World War II, which are a, a, a broader subject, you know? Certainly. So, so I, su I suppose what gave me the, the, um, gave me the oomph to go for it this time was the publishing editor when I sent a sample chapter in it and he was really supportive. That was another one, another, uh, and also, it was it was really the advice of um, guys like Jean Yves Nass. He's a, a French author who wrote Green Devils and uh, uh, Falschmjäger in Crete. They're big hardback books that um, were published in the in the late nineties, early two thousands. He gave me a lot of support because he had done a similar thing with his books, uh, where he, but he had he had gone the way that I didn't want to go. So he wrote about the campaigns 
and the battles and used extracts of veteran accounts that he had um, uh, corresponded with over the years. And it, it works out well, but if, if I'd have done that, it's just sort of doing the same thing as what Jean-Yves had done Certainly. but with different photographs. I didn't want to, to, to sort of, because his books were really well received by, by the, those enthusiasts. So I didn't want to take any of his glory, you know. <laughs> to, for, for, for someone like him to say that, you know, this is, this is a good thing to do. Uh, and like Mark Bando, who gave me some really good advice when it, when it came to the book. Um, and, I, I, and I tell you why, and it, and it changed really the book um, based on his advice that I found on this email. Because in my book that I wrote, and initially it was just gonna go straight in, just jump in, you're just gonna jump straight into what the veteran had to say. And of course, some of them go into quite descriptive battle scenes quite early on, and it might put people off. That, you know, particularly in terms of abbreviations, are used a lot in in the German military in the world in World War Two. And he suggested to write a short bio, a short introduction, introduce the veteran first, and then go straight into it. So that's what I did. I I used his advice and I wrote an intro about where they were born, when, where, what they, you know, what they did during the war, what they did after. And then I decided that at the end, once they finished talking with a bit about, you know, whether they're still alive or whether they passed away in the meantime, because it gets you thinking when you're reading, I wonder if this guy's still alive, you know, Certainly. he was born in 1927. Is he? And you get to the end and you think, oh, he oh, passed away three years ago. Right, okay. Um, and incidentally, I digress. And again, there's a, only one of the veterans is now still alive. Two of them have passed in the last couple of months. The last two, the, 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 the remaining one is um, Volker, who's the last account, who was the conscript um, in early 1944, late 44, early 45. All of the volunteer paratroopers who were in the book have now passed away. The last one was two weeks ago. Oh, that's a shame. I'm so happy you were able to capture their voices and, and get them out to the public before that happened. Though. This is the thing, you see, that I, I, I came in at the tail end of um, when all these veterans were in early 70s, early mid 70s, some of them late 70s. So, I mean, my own father's 77 and he's completely compass mentis, you know, and so I came in at the right time. But 10 years the other way, they'd either passed away or you, you, you can't get this level of information out of a 90 year old. It's OK, I have a 76 year old. But bearing in mind, some of these veterans wrote these accounts years ago. Yes, sir. Have just been lying there in a desk or in a in a booklet that they've written, unpublished. For who? Don't know. Because families probably weren't interested. Nobody else is interested because <laughs> you can talk about it. So they were lying there waiting to be handed over to me. And then others, you know, one one of them lived in Canada. Uh, Fred. Um, Cranfeld, Fred Cranfeld, who's in there, he said, I need to think, I need to, I've not thought about it for years. I've not thought about the war, you know, because he'd moved on. He'd got into, he'd come to the UK after the war. He didn't like it in the UK and he managed to get to Canada, built up a successful business in Canada, raised a family and his life was good. And what he'd done as an, a 19, 20 year old had, was just faint in his, in his memory. So I jogged it and his daughter came on the phone and said, look, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a couple of weeks. I, I know him. I, if he's thinking about something, it's going to take time. So he, he was in, in, a, in a room with a chair, notepad, and he wrote down everything and came back. I've just remembered that. And he could remember dates, times, things he'd done, the, 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 the bad things that he experienced, the good, the funny things, because I think it's important to have humor and you know and the obvious horror which comes with war and then we spoke on the phone for three hours and he just oh, wow. relayed everything he had he had and, and i just hastily scribbled it all down in, in my sort of awful shorthand <laughs> uh, and that was that you know but he was i think 80 then or 78 80 but his daughter came on the phone after the interview and said it's been an emotional time for him you know, not in a bad way. It's been good. He sort of aired his, 
and his daughter had then found out more about because he'd never said anything but she had read through the notes and she'd spoken to him and suddenly she she had a bit better insight into her father's late teenage years you know that no certainly carrying that for 50 years with no outlet has got to be very challenging exactly yeah. so it's this this it's the families who um yeah, I speak to the daughter of a veteran who lived up near London um, since 1945. He came back to the UK, married uh, an English woman and settled near London. And she, she, even though she'd been to Monte Cassino with him, she didn't know anything about his service. He never told her. She was like, what, why are we here in this, this beautiful monastery? And he said, well, I was here in 1944. So, well, why were you here in 94? What were you doing? <laughs> but there was no other information. And she turned to me when, um, in fact, he's on the back of the book. This is, uh, there's Werner Eichler there in Crete. And there is photographs as well on the front cover. Um, she knew nothing. So when I got in touch with her, I didn't know Werner had passed away because this is before I, I, I started the book project again. And she told me he passed away and I was, you know, gutted that we hadn't had more time to talk when I was doing the project first time round. And uh, she furnished a load of photographs. She said, look, Greg, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I can't tell you anything more that you probably don't know. You know, I, I know nothing. I, I just know that I went to Monte Cassino with him and we met a lot of his old friends and we, we went to a cemetery and then we went to another cemetery with some New Zealanders and we came home. And that was that. So I'm just glad that these men and a few others that are on my website have been able to uh, share their experiences because a lot of them are lost now. A lot of them have, are gone. And that's the same with American paratrooper veterans, British paratrooper veterans, all veterans. They've not told their story. It goes with them when they pass away. Yes, sir. Very, very true. One thing that's fantastic about your book is the level of illustration, uh, different photographs, different, not only of the men as young men, but uh, photographs with you now that they're, that, that they're older gentlemen, uh, photographs of mementos that they have, whether it's a, you know, a badge or a decoration or something like that. Uh, how many of those photographs were in the men's personal possession and how much did you have to like research and archives to find oh. anything? When I, when I, when I bagged, debagged this project in, in late 2017 and blew the dust off, I had a, uh, a floppy disk with, um, with a, a dodgy manuscript that had been put together. And I had a CD with the photographs and, a, and a, a photo album. And I think I had 54 photographs and that was it for the whole book. And I thought, oh, I gotta, where am I gonna get photographs? And of course, I'd lost contact in the 11 years, previous years with all these veterans. When I decided that that was what I was going to do the book, I wrote to all of them, knowing that I'm going to get bad news from many of them, which I did. Replies from some I didn't receive because they passed away and the family hadn't moved into the house. The house might be gone. The you know new occupants ripped the letter up. He don't live here anymore. Um, but I managed to track down through some very, very dodgy ways uh, <laughs> family members by going through phone books, you know, paying you could online and you can pay a certain amount of money to access American phone records. Certainly. Phone numbers, Canadian ones. And I'm ringing people up. I don't know what time it was in America, but I'm ringing people <laughs> up and saying, are you the son of so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, who, who the hell are you? And put the phone down. But I, uh, I managed to get hold of three uh, children, veterans' children, through doing that, ringing up numbers based on surnames in the in the in the general location of the last known address, and they were sort of, oh my god, you know, this is fantastic. The book's been published. Yeah, Dad told us all about you. And I'm like, oh my god, thank God, you got, I got your permission. Yeah, I got your permission. And by the way, I've got his whole photo. I've got his whole photograph album here. Oh my goodness. Scan them and send them, and and also. Uh, We've, we're still in touch with the daughter of his best friend who was with him in the war. I know they've got loads of photographs. Um, so it, it went on like that. And in the end, I think I ended up with 276 photographs. I had some friends who um, allowed me to use some photographs from their collections just to complement certain aspects. I mean, 
there was a wish list. Don't don't get me wrong. That I wrote a wish list of photographs that I that I wanted in the book, but how hard I tried and I did try, trust me, I spent quite a bit of money trying. Uh, I couldn't get, I just could not get, and I'm absolutely gutted that I couldn't get a contemporary photograph of Sepp, who the book's dedicated to, because Sepp was a, a really nice old guy that I, I um, corresponded with back in the late 90s. He died of lung cancer in, in 2001. So I dedicated the book to him because he, he was always seeking peace and, and, and justice after the war and you know and I tried getting in touch with a family member I finally after a year I found a adopted uh, his adopted daughter's daughter and the the correspondence was going absolutely fabulously I was so pleased she said we're gonna unbox all his records in the cellar I thought all of his records in the cellar that means there's <laughs> lots of photographs and I said, look, what I'm really after is a contemporary photograph of him in later life to complement the wartime photograph because I wanted to maintain continuity on each one. And she said, that's not a problem. I never heard from her again. Oh, was no. No, and I, three weeks later, I wrote back, emailed back, nothing. I wrote back, I wrote back twice. Um, I emailed again. I even got friendly with a, a guy in Germany who was a customs official and he sent her an official letter because he was interested in, but she didn't reply to that. So we, we don't know whether she may have passed away suddenly, a car accident or illness or, or what, and that's it, that, the trail went dead. Oh my goodness. So unfortunately, there's, there's a couple of, of veterans where the contemporary photographs are not available, which I'm absolutely gutted about, but I think every author that has a, a, a book with photographs in has a wish list and you might end up ticking some, but you won't never tick them all <laughs> unless, you, unless you're either rich or you've got contacts who can get you them. Certainly. No, I understand, but uh, you did an amazing job with it though. I mean, the, the illustrations are, are definitely my favorite part of the book. Just, uh, just fantastic. The, uh, sorry. Sorry. The, the only thing that is missing that I was guided about initially when we went through um, the book and the contents the the publisher was going to put maps in and that was because they've got their own cartographer that was going to draw up maps and some of them would have been quite complex because if you look at uh, the one at the back where there's a, it involves an 800 mile 800 kilometer exodus through Italy into Germany yes sir. Um, that would have that would have involved several maps because you you couldn't just have one because you wouldn't see any detail about crossing Alps and things like that you know yes sir I thought this is this could be fantastic we'll have we'll have maps of Crete we'll have maps of Normandy done and then at the end there was no maps the the map thing went and I was I was a bit guided but the book was still being published because it was running late you see it should have been uh, October last year December then it ran into March because of the way that, that, that uh, publishing houses work. And then I, when it was published, I was getting a lot of feedback, fantastic feedback and, and reviews from different places. And uh, a nice guy wrote, wrote a, a really positive review about the book, but he did comment about the lack of maps. But of course, <laughs> as soon as I read that, I was like, no, why couldn't the maps be in there? Because he said, uh, if, you, if you're going to read it, yeah, read it. It's a must. You must read it, but have an atlas to the side. <laughs> <laughs> so as you're reading the, ge the geographical points, you can flick the page on, oh, yeah. I know, oh, Bolzano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And you can <laughs> yes, sir. follow the, the track up through the Alps, you know. So, yeah, I, I do apologize, the, the lack of maps. But I, I hope the photographs and, uh, and, and all the other illustrations make up for it. No, they certainly do. I mean, the book is a treasure, Greg. I, I, it, it's fantastic. And I certainly do understand that the, the author is sometimes at the mercy of the publisher. So I, I oh, yeah. totally get that. Yeah. But when uh, you and I first started talking, I figured this was going to take us maybe maybe half an hour. We're well over that time, but it has been time well no. spent. <laughs> I, believe, I don't believe yes, it feels like 10 minutes. We've been chatting for about a little under an hour, sir. 
And, uh, oh, this, you're joking. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no it's, problem it's, at all. I, I, you, you've been a wonderful guest. I've really enjoyed having you. Uh, <laughs> right before we wrap up, though, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience, either a, a project you might be working on in the future or a detail about any of the men you'd like to share that we haven't addressed? Uh, any, any parting volleys? Yeah, well, my, my particular area of interest and has been for a long time is Crete, the Battle of Crete, May 1941. And I've been there a couple of years, a couple, uh, twice the last two years. And I just love it there. And, and the military history of it, not just 20th century, but before, you know, ancient history. It's got this history of, uh, of war. And of course, the invasion of Crete is, is of great interest to me. But all, the, all of the writers, all the writers you can see on my bookshelf, who've written about the Battle of Crete in May 1941, always uh, concentrate on the main units, you know, the main regiments. They overlook the, the smaller um, detachments, battalions, that, the ancillary units. So I've, I've got something in the pipeline about the, um, the, the Falsham Panzieger unit that, that sort of started off um, in the early days and took part in the Battle of Crete because I, I've got some inside sources in Germany and I've got a lot of documents and first-hand accounts from them, but I don't know yet whether I got enough for a book. Um, Understood. But, but if it's not a book, it'll be a booklet, I'm hoping, with photographs. And then the other project I'm, I'm working on at the moment is um, the German cemetery in Crete. You know, unlike, um, you, you see, if you've been to a German cemetery, you'll know that it just gives rank and, and, and everything else. Because there's a lot of interest in the Battle of Crete, uh, and, and as opposed to the Allied cemetery in Crete, where the, the, the rank and the unit is on, the Germans don't. So I've been investigating every single burial um, in Crete, which is working out to be about 4,000, I think. But I've, oh, I've my goodness. I've, I've, I've completed it now. So now I'm just going through the information, all the statistics and everything about which unit and, and, uh, and comparing them against lost lists and and hopefully produce some sort of booklet as a guidebook to the German losses on Crete. So you can take with you and then you can see that, oh yeah, these were all so-and-so company, da, 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 whatever. So they're just ticking me over at the moment, you know? I understand, but I understand. Ticking over with, with research. You know, I've, I've got lists and lists of stuff to get through and it just sits there. <laughs> And I'm, I'm a big procrastinator, but I, I do do quite a lot of weekends. I, I work too much in a week to, to do stuff in the evening. So I leave it all to the weekend and I go through lists. I work out statistics, percentages, and I'm a bit of a geek like that. But it's, it's all related to the same thing. No, well, it's fantastic. As soon as you're ready to come back on, we'd love to have you and, and talk about the progress you're making. So we yeah, are. Love <laughs> Terrific. So once again, folks, this is Ben Powers with the Commander's Voice. My guest today has been Mr. Greg Way, author of Fallschirmjäger, which is firsthand accounts of uh, German World War II paratroopers. Greg, thank you very much for joining us this evening. No, thank you, Ben. Thank you very much. All right. You take care. Have a good night, sir. And you. See you later, mate.